Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Not Conscious. Hello, welcome. Christopher, how are you, sir? Hello, good, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Today we have Danny Wu. He's the producer and director of Square One Documentary on Amazon Prime Video. Hey, Danny, are you over there? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So um, we'd love for you to share a little bit about your how you got to uh, have this be a project of yours. But then we'd love to hear more about you. So please feel free to take care of that first part, and then we can we can get to knowing you better. Sounds good. Excited to be on your show, Mark and Chris. Thanks. So tell us a little bit about how you got to have uh, this subject matter be your first documentary that you wanted to produce. Well, I always wanted to, you know, be a filmmaker, right? Growing up, that was, uh, that was one of my dreams. And um, I also had a dream of being a basketball player, but after some devastating knee injuries, um, that wasn't really a possibility anymore. Um, so filmmaking was kind of really my goal uh, for quite some time now. And um, just, I never thought it would come this early, right? Um, I always thought it would, I would go up the ladder, you know, go to film school, work on a PA and stuff like that. Um, but when um, this opportunity came, you know, when I um, had the opportunity to interview Josephine Zoni, um, I knew right there and then that I had to I had to turn this from a simple interview into a documentary. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, way to get started in that. How long did the whole thing take you from start to finish? Uh, well, I think if you do you mean the idea or from the first interview? Uh, probably from the idea would be a great start, but then curious how the whole, you know, when you actually hit the first interview to when you actually completed the project as well. Uh, so I don't think many people know this, but I, I did have a YouTube channel uh, back in the day. Um, I did make a couple of Michael Jackson videos on there. Right. And from that, um, I started researching more about the cases. You know, I wanted to interview more people um, for my YouTube channel. And there was this rumor back then um, that there was this girl who was friends uh, with the first accuser. And she was actually a witness for the 2005 case. Um, she has never spoken a story before. Um, so kind of became my goal to kind of find this, to find this witness, right? Um, and yeah. somehow, somehow I got a name. Uh, and don't really exactly recall how I got it, but it was on this blog and there was a comment and it led to the witness report. And this blog was from like 2008 or something. So wow. I had to dig really deep for that. And the name was Josephine Zoni. Um, so I looked up Josephine Zoni, you know, I'm searching up all these things about her online, seeing what she does now. And she's a publicist in New York, a pretty well-known publicist um, on top of that. Uh, all this time, I didn't even look her up on social media. So the moment that I did look her up on Twitter uh, was one of the most uh, surprising moments because she was actually following me. Uh, oh, no kidding. Uh, following you. Yeah, you have uh, a lot of followers, so it's hard to know everybody who's following you. Right? Well, back back then I had like 500. So uh, That's still like eight times what we have. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys are going to get there. You guys are going to get there. Oh, we're uh, going to get there. You guys have, sure. the, have the voice down. You know, you guys have <laughs> oh, the, you. you guys have the million dollar, million follower voice. So. <laughs> well, thank you. you know, and I've got a face for radio, so I'm going to do this job. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I see that she's, um she's actually defending Michael Jackson on her Twitter page. It was, it was kind of surprising to me, you know? So I sent her a Twitter DM. And I think this was, this was probably in the middle of March of 2019. Like towards the towards the end of March 2019, I shoot I shoot her a DM, and I tell her that hey you know I've done some Michael Jackson videos. Um, around that time, I had recently just like you guys, I interviewed Taj Jackson um, on my YouTube channel. So I told her that I interviewed Taj. I was wondering, I heard some rumors about you. Would you be interested in um, doing a interview in that style, like either through Skype or? I can come to New York and we can film an interview or something like that. And she replied that she actually replied like right away. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty, it was that's pretty crazy. crazy. 
Yeah, she replied. It's like right, it's right, almost right. synchronicity, right? Exactly. I was I when I saw that notification pop up, it was just it was I was out of the world. I had to I like called my dad up. I remember I was like, what should I do? Like, should I go through with this? It's a big moment, you know. And um, you know, that's Josephine, a huge moment. That that you must be like bursting, right? Because it's like your first get. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Because this is like a this is like breaking something new, you know. Because before this, no one even heard her story. Um, do you think that was your biggest um, guest or witness or whatever word you want to do for Square One? I mean, even bigger than Taj. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent, okay, 100%, okay, hundred percent. Um, no, nothing against Taj, obviously, but just no, of for course not. But in your mind, Taj you needed the... you needed her. That yeah, that exactly. was like your trump card, right? Exactly, because okay, she's, now I got you. Right, we we get Josephine's own. Um, I, I, I'll get to there. Why? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, we send her around. But obviously, but... the Taj the Taj challenge is the. I mean, you've got a direct familial contact, right? I mean, mm -hmm, exactly. In some we... cases they don't they don't even acknowledge alibis for direct relatives in some exactly. cases. Exactly. Exactly. Well, with Taj, you know, it gained a lot of popularity because Taj was always sharing the documentary later on. And, um, you know, for him to have that trust in me was also huge. And uh, the documentary probably wouldn't be as big as it is without Taj. Um, I really appreciated his openness when he came on with us as well. Oh, he, yeah, absolutely. He and Jess were phenomenal. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And so Josephine Zoni, she... Uh, messages me back. She says that um, she is interested in, um, she has seen my YouTube videos. She enjoyed them a lot. She said that she would be interested in an interview, but it's not a good time for her. Um, so that kind of, I was, I knew that I had a chance, right? That's, yeah. It's that's, like, uh, what's that? So you're saying there's a chance. It's a Jim Carrey. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, One of our favorite movies, by the way. So, dumb and dumber. So, so, Throughout the next two months, I kept, you know, just going back at her. Hey, do you think you can do this? Do you think you can do this? And um, you caught a scent, man. You were on it. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to be too pushy, you know. Right. It's really hard. Pushy. You do. You do dance that line because we're very, you know, we're very interested in getting a bunch of different people. But, you know, we want to give them the courtesy and respect that, that we're not just hounding them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's a it's a fine line. So you kind of kind of have to be friends with them but then you don't want to make it seem like it's opportunistic and um because i genuinely did like her as a person as well because she has done so many of the things that i wish to accomplish with my career and awesome. she was giving me a lot of good advice like even back then um but because she had a she was in a some one of her lead one of her clients um her bigger clients were in some of some legal legal battles, so she didn't think it was a good time to go public. Uh, but once that when that once that case stalled, uh, she agreed to do the interview with me. So uh, I packed my bags, flew to New York, and um, I, I brought a friend with me to record the first interview. And that first interview isn't what you guys see now. Uh, that first interview was like a face to face. Me and her were both on on screen. Okay. You know, the camera would be on her and then it would be me asking a question and it would be on her again. Okay. Got it. And um, so when I was doing it, I really like sitting in that seat and looking in her eyes and hearing her like say those words and tell those stories. It, it had such a, has a, such a great impact on me. Um, just feeling her say it to me. And the, so when I watched the video back of me asking her the questions and then she's speaking to me, through in the video uh, it didn't feel as powerful as she speaking to me directly right um, so that's when i had the idea that i had to it had to i had to get rid of myself um for that part and it would just i really to... thought her her the I, I found her eyes to be very expressive when she spoke she mm -hmm. she's very eloquent and well spoken yes <laughs> that came very, across very strongly i agree 100 percent agree with that so, you know, I had to make up my mind again to go back to New York and um, shoot the interview again. Um, but this time it would just be her on camera. And um, from that point on, I had the idea that 
Um, you know, if if Michael Jackson fans they watched that interview, that would mean a lot. You know, because they had the context of the case. But for people who who don't know the other side, you know, who don't know the allegations about Michael Jackson, you know, this doesn't really mean much, right? This is someone telling her story. It's an excellent uh, point. So from from that perspective, I knew that I had an opportunity here to to make a documentary um, to see let's just let's just see who else we can get right um, to to make this thing happen. So we got the Josephine interview done. I think around in in June, end of June, beginning of July of 2019. I think end of June. This was um when the rap. I I went to New York after the Raptors won the NBA um, championship. So that's around the end of June. Yeah. So end of June would be when we got our first scenes for the documentary. Oh, okay. Um, and from there, you know, I, I messaged Taj. I messaged um, Jenny Winings. Um, Geraldine Hughes, I emailed, I told her that I have a documentary opportunity, would you like to, um, jump on in? And of course, because I had gotten the Josephine interview done already, you know, I had, I had something to, to go off of, you know, I had interviewed one of, um, the first accusers, um, acquaintance. So, right. Cause you had a foundation at that point exactly, to, build, so. to build on top of. So to build off of that, so um, I get all these interviews done and um, I'm putting all this together. And at, originally I was going to be the one to, to narrate, it, narrate it and it just, it didn't feel right, you know? Um, so yeah. in the final, I said, why not? Um, Charles Thompson, everyone knows that he is so knowledgeable about this case. Um, very knowledgeable. I watched a lot of his, uh, he followed, we follow each other now on Twitter. That's and, awesome. Uh, I think he, he, yeah, he paid a very nice compliment to the last interview or the exactly. conversation we had. He, he told me about that too. He, um, he was like, Danny, you should listen to their interview. It was, it was really, really great. Um, so. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. I mean, we, we just want to have a conversation. We're just trying to get to know you. you yeah, know? exactly. So Charles, I shoot Charles, uh, but before, even before the child, um, for that entire summer, like morning and night, like it, we were just, I was working on that documentary to kind of put together like a structure that kind of worked. And well, that's one of the compliments about it is that it's one of the most organized, uh, you know, quote unquote defenses, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's been paid a lot of that acclaim. That I is think, very organized in that respect. Mm -hmm. I think one of my friend was mentioning to me this other day. I, I wouldn't consider it like a hundred percent valid, but um, it's because I also came from. I didn't come from a documentary filmmaking background. You know, I came from. I want to make movies. I want to make it easy to understand for people. Um, you know, after after making this, and you go on, you go online, and you read all these. Um, you read all these books or these articles about documentary filmmaking. There's so many, um, the rules you have to follow. Oh, your story has to be perfectly chronological. Um, this is, it, it's really intimidating. Whereas when I was going in, I didn't know any of these rules. And I was just trying to make the documentary how I saw would be fitting. Um, so we kind of jump around with the timeline a lot, you know. Yeah, but and, but if it but it flowed in the way you felt the story flowed exactly, exactly. I think before before this documentary kind of went mainstream, there were a couple fans that were even you know messaging me to say that hey, like you have chronological problems with your documentary, you should really fix that. Which I just I did not agree with, so I kind of stuck to my guns, and now it's really paying dividends because it's one of our strengths. Yeah, well, kudos to that because, I mean, you are the filmmaker. It's, it's your vision at the time as well, you know. You can obviously accept people's f constructive feedback, but it's also, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's yours. Yeah, which we have gotten a lot, a lot of great constructive feedback, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, the, I'll be honest, the, the community as a whole has been very supportive to us. We've probably about thirteen or 1,400 downloads already of wow. just the episode. 
So, and that's YouTube views combined with podcast downloads, but we have on both, obviously. So that's incredible. Um, that's, it's unbelievable. Like, and the support and then people, you know, correcting us, like there are a couple of things that I'll be honest, I just didn't know everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I like Michael Jackson, but I'm not, you know, number one super fan. I'm just not, cause <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I just don't know him that well, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I was, I was, a I was a pretty big fan when I was um, around grade seven. Okay. That was the year that that was the year that Michael Jackson passed away, right? And um, right. I would say my fandom like kind of just stalled over the years, and um, I wasn't like listening to Michael Jackson songs every day and stuff. But you know, it was he was still someone that I studied a lot when I was younger. So you know, I felt kind of qualified to talk about it uh, yeah. when the cases came out. So Which, um, yeah, yeah. Continue. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I lost my train of thought already. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's all good. I, I was just curious about just general. So how do, how does one get funding for, for a project like this? Well, is this something is personally funded or? Oh, it's personally funded. It's personally funded. Um, well, I was, I was, um, I was making YouTube videos before this, right? So. Right. I, and feel free to share your channel information and everything. Do you still have your channel up? Oh yeah. The, it's, it's just Danny Wu. It's just my name. Okay, because I did see one that had about five or six videos on it. Yeah, that's that's probably my channel. That's the one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I was already making YouTube videos, and you know, had a I had a Sony Sony ADD, which isn't you know the greatest camera, but it, does, it gets the job done. Um, but when it comes to filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, that would be uh, compared to the top films, that would be severely, severely. Um, um, not up to par with the right. cameras that they use for uh, sure but but we saved a lot you know on camera on equipment you know i'm i'm the only person like doing all this uh so the only the only price really was the the air cost travel cost uh, okay and the premiere cost that that kind of hurt the bank a little bit <laughs> <Not gonna lie. laughs> i'm um, hoping i'm hoping that you're recouping some of that with the oh uh, uh, <laughs> you know it's a uh, so you mentioned filmmaking in general. Um, I'm assuming from from what you just shared earlier that documentaries aren't necessarily your genre. What what kind of films are you looking to make in the future? Well, I, I'm I'm trying to focus on documentary filmmaking right now because um, okay, I found like I feel like there are a couple there are a couple more stories I wanted. So I just meant that when I was starting out, I never saw documentary filmmaking as a as a road I would go down, you know, you don't, we don't always choose what we get into. Isn't um, that funny how that works out? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But Cause I, it, I mean, it definitely seems like a calling of yours, the way this one turned out, just the, the quality and the way and the carefulness that you took in making it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> if you guys saw some of the setups, oh yes. my gosh, <laughs> I think with the, with the Geraldine Hughes interview, um, we didn't I actually had left my tripod in the Uber and uh, what did you my, set it up on? So my friend Liam and I, uh, we were, we were in Skid Row in LA um, because that's where she was volunteering. And we, we had a cam, we had one camera and a backpack and uh, we get, we get into where she was working and we're just trying to find random objects to, you know, be able to make something that hold the camera up. Um, so we were finding toilet paper, like stacking chairs up on top of each other. <laughs> that's that's really how we did it. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So it's like teeter tottering as you're trying to film. Yeah, you know, you just you're trying to you're trying to find solutions, right? Because Absolutely. the Uber the Uber driver wasn't wasn't answering her calls. You know, he didn't want to come back to the area. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. If, I don't even know where that is, but I know the term. I know all well, the Skid Row. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. I want to be there. Um, which what a shocker you want to go back there <laughs> <laughs> I'm not turning around I don't, I don't appreciate you stealing my question Mark completely completely fair and um, you know even when we were leaving the Uber drivers wouldn't pick us up in the area they would like ask us to walk out are and you then, kidding wow yeah maybe maybe she could have given you a ride out or something like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, she was she was she was still um, she was still volunteering after we left wow that's amazing so how safe did you feel? I mean, did you feel okay going in there? Uh, you know, it, 
we did we did feel safe you know it was a it was a relatively close walk to where she was volunteering and once we got there you know she she was just very warm to us um everyone there seemed to love her and we were just more focused on uh, getting the interview done and if you the audio i mean even though she was wearing a lavalier mic um, the music was blasting, was blasting um, in the other room. And at one point during the interview, someone came in to the room where we were doing our interview and just turned the turned the tap on, turned the tap on, and he left. Like for the water, like turned the water on full and just walked out. Yep, yep. <laughs> the washroom was right behind us. Oh my god, and, that's uh, funny. Yeah, and um well even in the even in the documentary, if you listen really carefully, you could hear like um toilets being flushed and the tap being turned on. Um if you listen really People carefully. People taking showers, you know. Oh, there's there's no showers there. No showers. <laughs> No shower. You should there. have a square one outtake, uh, like a <laughs> like a blooper reel or something. <laughs> oh my gosh! gosh. Yeah, That's but funny. but um, we were we were running severely behind schedule that day because we shot that the same day I arrived in LA, and the second day was when I shot the Taj interview. Yeah, he, was, he wasn't that happy with that one. He's like, I didn't like how I was dressing that. I just thought it was another interview. I thought yeah. that was pretty telling. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you, you're trying to hit him cold, right? Like, you, yeah, you don't want absolutely. him to be prepared for something like that. Not for something like this, because you want the real response. You want the real response. You want to see his reaction, you know, on screen. If he's all prepared for it, you know, that might not look as authentic. With all the interviews you did, Danny, how often did you stick to the scripted questions you had and how often did you go off the cuff where an answer that a, was given was not what you expected. So it went down a different path. Uh, I think it, it, it's dependent on the person you're interviewing. Of course. Right. Um, for example, if you're interviewing someone who uh, loves to tell stories as a storyteller themselves, Mm -hmm. um, you kind of you kind of just give them that creative liberty to just go off on their story, and you just kind of add little bits to it, right? And um, you mean they... Taj, <laughs> Taj, Jenny, you know, people like that, Geraldine. Um, you know, with Gerald with Geraldine's interview, it was it was so loud, it was so loud in that room that me and Liam we could barely hear what she was saying. So you know, I had to just stick to the script and ask the questions because. Okay. I, I didn't really know what she was saying, uh, but when I when I came back, I, I had to I listened to it back and uh, we heard her we, we heard her story that way. Okay. So to answer your question, I would say it's um it's dependent on who you're interviewing. You know, if they've been telling their stories for a long time, they um, had a pre um, they have an answer drawn up ready. Obviously, stick to the script, but. If they're more spontaneous, more conversation, like more conversation type, um, you got to go off, um, go off of them. So you're okay with the fact that, hey, if I don't get half of my answers, that's okay because the interview could still be really good because of the flow of it. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred, a hundred percent. Because you know a lot of a lot of this, you know, when you make a film like this, you realize like how many of these like crazy moments are just divine accidents. You know, if this didn't happen, if that didn't happen, um, there would be no square one. Um, so you start being more appreciative of um, of um, people's um, people's answers, especially mm -hmm. you got to, especially for Charles, we probably use like one fourth of his interview material, if that. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of nuggets in there that you got to kind of just go in and dig out. Wow. Yeah, I'm really excited to actually have an opportunity to have a conversation with him as well. Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. He, yeah, and and what's interesting to us is like, once again, Chris and I don't come from the MJ fam. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't. But I met Jess on Twitter through Synchronicity, right? And mm -hmm. this happened, changed my mind, and Jess got us introduced to, to yourself and to Taj. And, but I like the justice of it. I thought that, that one thing that, uh, that one sex ring that Charles uncovered 
was mm-hmm. is amazing as well. I just find him fascinating as well as yourself. Like you're just fascinating individuals to me. I just love <laughs> going inside your head and hearing, you know, your thoughts and how you got to where you got and all your processes. Oh, thank you. Beth. Thank you for that. So what's uh, next on the docket for Danny? Uh, next on the docket. Well, um, well, ne- right now, you know, square one is currently, it's still kind of hot on Amazon prime right now. I think in Canada, we just hit number one in documentaries overall. And we're also, Congratulations. The top, also top 20 in movies overall, which that that's just unbelievable to me. Wow. Congratulations. That, that is congratulations. <laughs> I live in Canada, right? So kind of, kind of proud about that. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were uh, number 102 in Venezuela as of this morning or something. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think they have a total of six downloads and somehow we ranked on there. It was, it was the funniest thing. The stupidest the only thing, thing. Which we're ranked. It's a big <laughs> podcast country. Yeah. That's what I hear. You know, those six downloads really get us, get us on the map. <laughs> <laughs> but ho- hopefully this helps a little bit with that. No, the, uh, absolutely. No, this has been great. And, and like I said, we're not doing it for that. We're, we're really so interested in the story. Yeah, you know? exactly. You don't go into things like this being like, "Oh, I want to have the number one documentary on Amazon Prime." You know that that's the goal. Like, no, that's that that comes with it. You know, the passion has to be has to be from the heart. Did you guys watch it on Amazon Prime? Absolutely, yep. yes. I watched it three times. Wow, wow! Thank you for that. No, well, I mean, you know, Je- Jess was so passionate about it when she when we got introduced there on Twitter, and I. I wanted to be as informed as I could because, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, it's like watching a movie, you know, I wanted to almost memorize the parts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, Amazon prime has just been insane. I think in the short term, what's going to happen next is um, I think on the one, one year anniversary of square one, you know, the original square one, that was a YouTube release. Right, um, we're uh, we're actually talking about it because I think someone on Twitter talked about it with you. Is it October fifth? October fifth, or you know, maybe even a little bit earlier to um, October second. I was thinking okay. October second or fifth, we could do the one year anniversary. You know, just to because last year we released Square One October fifth. Congratulations! And, That's really awesome. And that was the original cut, right? We kind of use YouTube as our film festival um, yeah. because we did not, I had, trust me, I had no idea how any of this worked. You know, I had no idea about film festivals, stuff like that. I think after, after Square One premiered in LA, Taj's producer came to me and she was talking about how I should really look into getting this premiered at other festivals, other big festivals, and they would be interested in having me. And I just had no idea what that meant. <laughs> right. Like at the time, I, I, I'm so embarrassed now, but I had no idea what that meant um, because I had already announced on YouTube that I'm going to be releasing the documentary the following week. So I don't have time to go release it in other festivals, right? Because I would be yeah. going back on my word. Um, so when it finally re- released on YouTube, it had around 100K views on the first day, I want to say wow. around 100k, 150k. How the heck did it get so? How did it go viral so quick? And then, <laughs> as as fast as it go viral though, um, it just it, it slowed down just as fast. Um, sure. Well, you have your the, spike, right? Exactly. So, from from that's the one heck of a spike day, though. Sorry, Danny. I'm, I mean, uh-huh. that's a huge spike. Huge spike from this from the second day to to now. Um, I think the total views of our of our YouTube YouTube raw cut is around five hundred thousand now. So okay. relatively slow compared to compared to the first day momentum. Right, but and also if it was only on YouTube, I'm sure those exactly. views would be Scott would be the numbers that you'd have that I mean, you're getting through Amazon. I mean, and I, mean else. I mean exactly. That's why um, you know in January we did a we did a premiere in Amsterdam, and <laughs> there was this there was this lady she came up to me. She came up to me and she was, um, she held her index finger and thumb together, almost like a pinch. Um, she was gesturing that to me. She said, Hey, Danny, I just have a question. You know, I, I, I've been checking the YouTube views every day. Why is it so little? 
And I, <laughs> I, was, I was, I don't know, Karen, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying my best. <laughs> Yeah, but, we, we have a podcast that we're just starting. We don't watch that every two seconds. I'm not clicking refresh yeah. to see if we got one extra download, you know, every yeah. three seconds. Um, but, you know, learning. So what I did basically was I looked up other top indie indie documentaries um, on Amazon Prime. And I kind of kind of looked at their road, you know, what streaming services did they go on? Um, did they sign their rights over to a distribution company? Stuff like that. And from there, um, I decided to put it on Amazon Prime. And now it's on Tubi TV as well. Oh, it's on uh, Tubi as well. Yeah, it's on Tubi okay. as well. Yeah, Tubi is a free one with ads, right? Yes. Um, okay. It's on Tubi. Um, and I think it's actually made it to the most popular page already. So that's kind of wild. Oh, so Tubi has ads um, in the middle of the um, movie. Or right. something like that okay. yeah yeah they have like broken out okay but it's so still that's free so that's why it, the, the overall length is longer because they have ads i would guess yes that makes sense <sighs> okay now now i can sleep easy at night thank you guys um, <laughs> but, regarding um amazon prime danny um i have no idea and that's why i'm going to ask you i'm a big fan of how things work behind the scenes and logistics can you tell me or how in two minutes, three minutes, or twenty, whatever. How do you? How did you get on Amazon Prime? You had to go through a distribution company, and then they did the work, or how does? I'm curious on how that all happens. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Um, so to get on Amazon Prime, there are two ways. Um, if you distribute it by yourself, you can get on U.S., U.K., and Germany if they accept your. Um, if they accept your film, um, which is getting so harder and harder. So you like have to apply? Now. You have to apply and they have to manually approve your video, make sure everything is correct. And they're trying to cut down on low quality content now, right? So it's getting increasingly, increasingly harder. Okay. Um, another way is to go through a distribution company. Um, but oftentimes um, distribution companies, they want to, they want the rights to your documentary. Um, but then they would, they would be able to get it on Amazon Prime, Tubi, stuff like that much, much quicker. Um, so what I ended up doing was, um, first we reached out to a couple distribution companies and um, they said that they would have, they would be happy to put it on Amazon Prime, but they would need the complete rights of the documentary, um, which I just didn't, didn't feel comfortable giving up. You know, you hear horror stories about that all the time. Of course. Giving up the rights to their project. Um, but what we did was originally we just, uh, we submitted it. Uh, we, 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 we first, we did a, we did a 2.0 cut, right? We took all the advice we got on YouTube, kind of, um, I had Jess send me a lot of stuff and I kind of just, um, went over it, you know, Jess was sending me like hundreds and hundreds of documents, like every day, things I can improve, things I can do better. Cause she's um, nuts. New, new, new evidence. Yeah. She, she, she is crazy. Awesome. <laughs> and I mean, awesome more than crazy. She is just a hound dog. Holy <laughs> mackerel. She was flooding yes. our DMS with uh, you would know that. like PD. I was loving it. I mean, she sent us the Google drive and this and that it was awesome. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So sorry, so go ahead. <laughs> so I have to like, I have to dig through these things like every day. Right. And just find, and I hate to say it, but like 90% of it is useless. You know, I'm not going to, that's, it's not going to work in the documentary. There's always yeah, that's like, just truth though. I mean, that's like all data, right? That's all, all information. And I tell her to send me those things too, you know, because it's all subject, it's all subjective, but there's always like one or two things that I'm like, okay, I need, I need to incorporate this somehow. Uh, which is, which is an annoying part because like, if she sends like a hundred things every day and none of them work, I can just tell her to stop sending me, sending me stuff. But now, like, every time it was, like, one or two that turns out to be, like, good, you know, you have to tell her to keep doing it. And yeah, I mean, up. you just can't stop. Unfortunately, it's one of those, like, uh, you know, prices to pay, you know. <laughs> but it, it was fantastic, though. And, um, you know. And she was awesome. She managed to find some crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so we incorporated some of that into Square One 2.0 and uh, submitted it. Just did the subtitles by herself. 
Um, we submitted it into Amazon Prime, um, US, UK. And what Jess did was um, she organized a bunch of Michael Jackson fans who wanted to do the subtitles um, for other countries, right? So all those um, people who have contributed to subtitles deserve, deserve so, so much credit. So, so much credit. And they've all gotten a shout out on a credit on IMDb for their, for their hard work. Um, but basically they've translated um, all the English characters to um, the language where they're from. So uh, we were able to submit it to, at first to US, UK and Germany. And it, it took, it took so, so long. Um, like months for it to finally be accepted uh, into Germany. And, um, you know, in the beginning, I never, I never really like expected it to take off or anything like that. Right. Because when you read, <laughs> when you read Reddit, for example, for some indie, indie filmmakers, and they talk about their experiences with Amazon prime, it's, it's more like, Oh, you just, you do it for, you do it for the clout. You do it for the credit. You yeah, do like it the so exposure you, at least. Yeah, ex exactly. Get... You do it so you can say in the future um, that you got a documentary on Amazon Prime, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, it was it was just steadily, steadily increasing. And then all of a sudden, US and UK, when they accepted it, you know, a month in, two months in, you can just see the documentary climbing, climbing the rankings. Like every day, I was climbing one or two spots, and I can I can see the numbers every day, right? I can see the minutes streamed is increasing by a lot as well. Yeah, and I remember I set a goal. I looked I looked up at the documentaries, and there's a documentary called One Child Nation, and I kind of just was like, okay, if we could get Square One to that level right there, like behind right. it, that would be pretty cool. And then like four days later, I woke up and Square One was like two 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 spots ahead. And that was, that was just, I think that was just so, so, so surreal. And I think in the first month, I mean, the first two months we had already uh, broken the amount of views that YouTube had, amount of minutes streamed, I should say. Um, so now we have done the YouTube minutes streamed many, many times over where YouTube, YouTube, because YouTube, the documentary on YouTube, um, to, to, to put it lightly, like it was, it was kind of a flop, right? For a project this big. Right. Um, For, well, in your eyes, in your in estimation. My, in, right? my, in, in my estimation. Cause you, you have know, personal goals that, that you'd like to have to, yeah. to reach and everything. I mean, I mean, for example, if you get a hundred K views on the first day, you're going to, you're going to kind of expect it to keep going at some pace like that. Right. Yeah. But something, the, right. And for the next, next few months, you get like, 50k <laughs> it's a it's a it's a very big slowdown yeah just, it, but it kind of seems to be extremes doesn't it on in just, social media world yeah whereas um on amazon prime you know it's a there's less there's less document there's less um videos to compete with and for example no one really goes on to youtube to watch a documentary they go on youtube to watch something quick you know something light right. um you don't you don't go on youtube saying i'm gonna sit down and watch an hour and a half of a documentary you know not many people do that whereas Absolutely if you not. whereas for amazon prime for example you probably already um opening amazon prime you're browsing with the mindset that i'm going to sit down here and i'm going to watch something completely through um, at a longer length uh, so i think that's the reason that the amazon prime document the documentary on amazon prime has done so much better to where in July actually reached the number one spot, um, which is still, still, still shocking to me. And, um, you know, the numbers, the numbers reflect that. So it's incredible. Yeah. It's a That's slow, awesome. Yeah, it's slow, and slow I did ride. find, I did find square one on Tubi cause I happen to have Tubi and it's an, it does show 93 minutes. So there is a four minute difference. It must be, com I'm assuming it's commercials. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of not at ease about that, but I'm hoping. Are I'm you a little concerned? I, I, I've, I've skimmed it. I'm skimmed it. It seemed fine, okay. but I just, I didn't know where the extra three minutes came from. Sure. That's probably what it is. Cause I think they come in like 15 second bursts or whatever, every, 
X amount yeah. of minutes. Yeah, I'm also trying to get it on the mail on demand before um before October before our October rally. Very awesome. Do you have some kind of rally planned or scheduled? Um yeah, that was um that's what you guys saw on Twitter um for the one oh. year. Go on. Oh year. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz what happened last year was that we were they were trying to trend it to go worldwide, right? To make the hashtag go number or to rank worldwide. And um what happened was that they planned the rally an hour before the documentary dropped. So, an hour before the documentary dropped, lots and lots of hashtags like it was trending in a couple countries, but then as the documentary like rolled out, no one was tweeting anymore because they were all watching the documentary. <laughs> so, and then they try to catch. <laughs> yeah, kind of a victim of your own creation there. Yeah, and then afterwards, you know, they tweet again. Uh, so when we look at it afterwards, numbers are pretty high. I think we were at like 50K tweets or something like that. We were like higher than um, most of the ones that were work that were ranking top of the and world hashtag but. wwe like they always <laughs> they're always ranking number one yeah it's crazy um, but because i think it's because of the um, the time that um we didn't we weren't able to rank worldwide well, that's pretty awesome i mean it's just crazy that you're number one in canada your home country congratulations yeah because it was, it was crazy because i was getting I was getting DMs from people that I haven't seen in years about how they just watched me on Amazon Prime. Um, that's pretty funny because um, someone messaged me, um, congratulating me and telling me how much they liked it. And I was I was out eating right. Now. I was out eating when he sent that. Um, and it turns out like he he was in the same restaurant. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't go say hi though. That was gonna be too awkward. But, what? Uh, Why not? <laughs> you want to give know, a shout like, out to this person right now we can we can clarify it so the nah, person feels all, loved it's all, okay it's that all person in the restaurant that tweeted daniel it wasn't it wasn't a restaurant it was a food oh. court it's a food court oh food oh, court okay. okay the food court that danny got the tweet Sorry, you know I, who I don't you want are. you don't want people to know i eat at a food court okay come on okay that's give okay man there's nothing right wrong with that hey i get an orange julius every once in a while food courts are great <laughs> hot dog on a stick come all that on. stuff Boardwalk fries. Yeah, we're, we're nice. good. I love just chilling, you know, by myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. How that? You know what? The mall, a food court's a great place that people watch. Right. Mm -hmm, exactly. All and the as a documentary like filmmaker, me. I would think that you—that's like one of your things. <laughs> oh my god, that's your next documentary, the food court. Chris and I sit <laughs> in places all day and just watch people just do their stuff. It's great. <laughs> that's not true at all, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. That's, yeah, same. It's just it's, it's nice to be like alone, you know. Yeah, kind of be I, alone in your thoughts. We have the Ooh. solitude gene in us. We uh, we do like to kind of break off on our own. Quiet time. <laughs> yeah, I, I need that. Thing. A lot of a lot of thinking for square one was done inside a mall or driving. Yeah, I can I, imagine. I agree with that. So, do you get much sleep <laughs> during during the documentary? Uh, just in general, it sounds like your mind's going a mile a minute like ours does. Um, it was um, during during the um, the documentary filmmaking process, the editing process. It was it was pretty tough because my parents were actually over for the summer, um, and they had brought um, my cousin as well, my younger cousin, and because they they would trap, they would come over from China, and we would do a U.S. road trip usually every year. Um, but because of the square one stuff, you know, it's kind of, kind of tough to road trip and edit, right? Um, it just doesn't, doesn't really work. Yeah. It's kind of um, hard. You have to have better equipment that, you know, you're not exactly. you know, mobile like that. So, so, so what ended up happening was, um, a lot of times I would spend the morning with them and then in the afternoon, that would be afternoon to about like four five, I would want to say five at night, um, five into the morning, I should say, that's when I would be editing and then take a quick nap and then hang out with them again. And then, you know, that's, that was a cycle. <laughs> wow. That was, that must've been rough for how many months was that? Uh, that was about like two months, two months or so. And then yeah. college like, all nighters every night. 
then, <laughs> two months. But, but this is this is fun though, right? Because this is like true. things that you want to do. Project, right? Exactly. So this is this is very different from. Uh, I was also was I graduated by then. I was also in school for like half the um for the first term of summer. So I think that was right during the Josephine Zoni interview. Yes, that's also another part. When I was doing the Josephine Zoni interview, I was um I was in school and I had so many midterms due. So I would interview Josie and I would go home and I have to write a freaking essay <laughs> for my, for my, for my class. Right? Yeah, for my class. So and, you were on the plane to New York studying? Yeah. Oh well before the before the interview, you know, I kinda you know, there wasn't much to prep for, for the interview because I already knew what to expect. Uh, but I, 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 had, I had a few essays due and I had a big final exam the day that I got back. So, um, yeah, I had to, had to balance that. I almost forgot about it. God it seems damn. like a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was my final term, you know, and it was my final two, final few assignments. So from that perspective, it was kind of fun to finally finish it. Heck yeah. How'd you end up doing? Uh, I think on the, on the paper, I got like, I got an 80%, which is, um, which is all right. It was, it that's, was great. Yeah, that's a, that's a B we'll take it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, in, in Canada, that's an A actually. That's an A. Well, we'll take that too. <laughs> Canadians are so friendly. I went yeah. to the wrong country. It's a it's an A minus in Canada if you're eighty percent and above. Wow. Yeah, we we're in the wrong country. Is that because of the exchange rate? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. No idea. And then oh, that's funny. For the for the final what, exam, what college was that? If you don't mind us asking what your credentials are, what what university did you get? I went to UBC. It's in British Columbia. British Columbia. Okay. Yeah, we were one of the final schools to shut down for COVID. So for a while, we were actually the number one ranked school in the world. Wow. Because you were open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so, pretty look, cool. Yeah, I'll pretty take cool. it. Look, if every other podcast shut down just for one day, mm-hmm. and we could just have one download, and then we there win. There you go. UBC is um, the big university in my in my city. Yeah. Uh, in, in Vancouver? In Vancouver, yes. Yeah. And, yeah, British um, Columbia is gorgeous up there i wish i actually visited i just see pictures it is i've been there maybe it's danny's lovely. gonna invite us but i'm yeah. not gonna put him on the spot on here or anything you guys are already invited man already invited. oh thanks man well you're welcome to phoenix anytime you want it's only 116 degrees so we can we can throw our that's a lot in centigrade <laughs> it's like 44 it's high centigrades for sure you can throw you guys are from phoenix yes yeah we're in phoenix well my um my high school alumni, Steve Nash, sons. Yes, he did. Yes. Many, many years. Yes, with yeah, the son. Recently, he had a head coach gig. But um, I'm sure he has. He's talented, and he likes soccer as well. And soccer, football. biking, yes. skating. He's very, 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 very athletic. Talented. Very, very talented. He seems like a really nice guy. Is he? Did he contribute a lot to your school after he left? Oh <laughs> no! What a um, weird, like, what a weird tangent that took. <laughs> he, did, he did come to like two of my, one of my games though. He told me good game afterwards. Very cool. Yeah, what, was were you like looking up to him because he was an alumnus, alumnus at the time, and you wanted to be a basketball player? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that I went to the school that I went to. Um, I went to a boarding school in Victoria, so I was oh. living by myself since grade eight. It was, it was really, really tough. You know, people always like to glamorize how fun boarding school was, but it was not in the beginning for me. People um, say boarding school is fun. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that I don't know what that. I don't. Is. That I've never heard that before. <laughs> Maybe like in TV shows and TV shows, people people kind of. It like seems to, like a cool club to be in in TV shows, but it I don't think it it's that's advertised. No, the uniforms, absolutely not. Oh, yeah, as a, as a pain, floggings. Man. <laughs> Froggies are the worst. <laughs> Those are the worst, my friend. Yeah, but the game that Steve Nash went to, um, that was also the first game that my mom has came to see me play since like six years prior. So wow. that was like a pretty pretty big day for me. And I think I won uh, and I won the first team all star at that tournament, which was like the first person from my school to win it since Nash at that tournament. So it was, wow. it was, all, it was all pretty fun. That's amazing. Yeah. I, that I didn't think it's an knew, awesome story. I didn't think he knew that part though, but um, 
He does now. I, I see a, like a mini documentary just about that little story about how you wanted to do that with basketball and your connection with Nash. Oh, that's that's one of the future projects that I want to get into. You know. Oh wow. Uh, because um, my my coach my coach has such a such an insane history, his career in general. You know, he coached Steve Nash. Um, he was actually also um, accused of some stuff by students. Um, that he was now um, he was quitted from. Oh and wow! Now the gym is gym is named after him. Uh, but I did I did pitch a documentary idea out uh, to a few grants about basketball um, between uh, about like three friends like me and my two other friends um, our basketball careers. But um, I guess they didn't they they want to go in another direction. So. Um, yeah, but maybe at some future point you've got, you know, you've got two passions. You've got your documentary passion and the basketball has always been there for you. Exactly, exactly. I'm, I'm sure I could, it. I don't really, I don't really need that grant anyway, to be honest, because um, I could just film it myself. This just in, Danny Wu, he's balling people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that oh, yeah. something you're going to keep pursuing, that basketball movie? That basketball movie? Uh, it's a documentary. It would well, be a yeah. documentary. Um, but I have to, I have to finish um, – well, going back to your freaking point from maybe an hour ago. We do that a lot. Yeah, about... we were going to title this Tangents, but um, we felt the other name was better. Yeah. <laughs> going back to your point, like an hour ago, um, I do have a few other projects lined up. Um, but after after all that, this is definitely something something that I will look into. And what are the other projects you have lined up? Um, well... As you guys know, I was um I was in China for for quarantine because I went back to China for Chinese New Year uh, to spend with my family, and I kind of just, just got stuck there right? <laughs> because of COVID. Yeah, yeah we, we saw watched that. we watched your video. It was, which... it, was um, it was supposed to be a we were supposed to continue touring. Like we were we were thinking of going on going to other countries to, for the Square One tour. Um. But this was kind of like a blessing in disguise because, you know, that kind of sat me down, gave me time to reflect on what I needed to do to move this project forward, you know. Yeah. I mean, February would have been six months in exactly. So that's probably a perfect time to really reflect and kind of see where you're at and where you want to be. Yeah, because we say that the documentary was released in 2019, but it really it really was released in 2020 um, because that's when when it hit Amazon Prime. That's when like people who weren't Michael Jackson fans began watching it, right? right. Like a hundred K fan, that's cool, but all hundred K probably love Michael Jackson, right? Right, so. right. And and I mean, let's not you know, let's be honest. If you have an affinity towards someone, you're going to be more defensive or supportive of them. Exactly, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, and that was never that was never my goal of the documentary. My goal was always to appeal to neutrals you know people like um chris and mark um so um and kudos to you for that because it did not appear like any kind of fan i've seen some of some of the supporter pages before or some of the works of supporters and it just and you even see the tweets right it's just like um, it was presented very well and i have to give kudos to the Michael Jackson fans for that because they've done so much of the groundwork, right? They've done so much of the groundwork that I could just go in and kind of take from their resources uh, because it's almost like a library. Um, So yeah, it's an amazingly supportive community. Amazingly, amazingly supportive community. And that's the other thing, you know, I did a, I did an interview recently with, uh, with Newsy, with Newsy. And, um, you know, he was, he was, um, he was kind of just um, getting. Have you guys seen that interview? Yes, I have. How how'd you feel about it? Uh, I thought he was kind of a jerk face. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that not accurate or was that? <laughs> Chris is the kind one, of the <laughs> and I'm the nice one. <laughs> have you seen it, Mark? I can't say that I have. What? What? Where was? How it? is it that I've seen it and you haven't? I. What is wrong with the universe I looked, right now? I was on your page, Danny, and I watched the videos that you had on there. I didn't see that interview. This was on Twitter. This was on Twitter. This was on oh, Twitter. Oh, I didn't. And I'm not even I the big so Twitter sorry. guy either. Look, right. I'm an, I'm an Two ignoramus. Two demerits, Marcus. I, 
Okay, um, this just in: I should never do a documentary because I'm not thorough enough. <laughs> but good thing I'm the Virgo. I'm going to take gonna I'm going to take shit. Chris's word for it and say that it, he was a jerk face. But uh, can we talk about it? Yes. Yeah, so share Danny, this confirm or deny that he was. And a jerk I will face. watch it right after this. I I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to confirm nor deny. Okay. But I'll, I'll let I'll Chris. Can okay, Chris okay, talk shit? And you can just sit there and listen. About that. <laughs> you tell us about Newsy. I'll give. I'll give some context to to the story. Please. Oh, please, um, yes. Because I, I do think it, it came from a good place in the beginning. Um, so I get a I get a message from their producer um, that he has watched Square One, and from the vibe that I got, he really enjoyed it. He really liked it. You know, he's telling me how um, he's very happy that he 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 understood why it's number one on Amazon Prime. He said, if I needed any more publicity, you know, free to talk about it on his show, I'll talk about it any way, like live, recorded, whatever. Um, so, you know, I talk, talk it over with some of my team and they, they feel that's a, it's a good idea as well. Um, so we set it up and, um, I, the day before, right. He, he told me that the anchor, the anchor is going to watch the documentary tonight and, um, He's going to be interviewing me. So then you realize that it's kind of like out of the producer's hands, right? Because um, this is someone else that's watching the documentary. It's not the guy who DM'd me that. Right. Um, but but still, though, um, I asked him, you know, well, what kind of questions should I be expecting? And he was just going to be like, oh, you know, talk about... Talk about how you got your documentary onto Amazon Prime. Talk about how you got sourcing. You know, what do you think really is going on? Stuff like that. So it sounds good on paper, right? Yeah. And, uh, it's the stuff that we actually ask and actually care about, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Like what, what we talk about? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so, so I get on, right? I get on the interview. And um, I'm, talking, I'm talking to that guy. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I always kind of... I was expecting it, right? I wasn't, I was, I wasn't hoping for it to happen, but you know, you always kind of expect the worst. And uh, it's good at least to have like a preparation for it, or just in yeah. case. Yeah. So, so he's talking to me. He's like, "Yeah, I've seen your, I've seen your, seen your documentary. You know, it's, it's great." And I'm, I'm also, I've also seen the other one. You know, so many of the things in your documentary, like I've never seen, seen anywhere before. It is very, very kind to me. Um, and as the interview started, you know, one of the questions he literally asked me was, um, he was telling me how, he was telling me how, um, he was expecting square one to have like 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. And it even blew that away. It had 98. Just like, even like all the stuff praising the documentary. Right. Right. And, then, and we even went into that and, uh, with Taj and Jess, like all those scores. <laughs> and then, you know, Midway through the interview, you can kind of just feel the tie shift. Um, the how, who are you, Danny Wu questions started, started coming in. Uh, and, um, what, what, do you know the first, the first question that kind of, I, I really turned. don't recall, but what happened was, um, he asked a question that was like, that was kind of spinning, spinning what I was saying, right? Because he would take little parts of the documentary, take it out of context. And then interrogate me about it as if that was my entire point of the documentary. You know, for example, right. he would talk about the Evan Chandler phone call about how, hey, wouldn't you want a nasty attorney as well? Yep, I remember but, that. It's like, okay, but what about everything else he has said, everything else he has done? You're taking one line that he has said, you know. Um, but when I kind yeah, of but felt. You wouldn't want a nasty father. I mean, like, <laughs> sorry, it was like, I don't care. It's irrelevant what, what yeah. uh, Jordan wants. I, okay. wanna, I would want a nasty criminal attorney, you know? Right. But, but anyway, so so he kind of caught me a little bit off guard. I I, I was like, hey, I'm going to give me 10 seconds. So I kind of took 10 seconds to kind of just prepare myself for the onslaught that was going to come. Uh, understand that this wasn't going to be like a, one of those interviews that's a, uh, they talk about the documentary, you know, they're going to be doing this to get a headline and um, agenda driven and clickbaity and all that. Yeah. And, um, so, so the next, next three, 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 four minutes of the interview was basically just, just all that, all that. 
And, um, you know, he ended it with saying that he uh, looked forward to seeing a lot of my future projects. Uh, but when it got on air, all the things that he praised about Square One, um, talking about, or even talking about how he was excited to see my future projects, um, it's all, all cut out. Only yeah. thing that's left is the accusation, <laughs> the interrogation. That's awful. I mean, that's just, it's, it's that distortion of truth, right? And then, you know, the next day, I think a lot of fans were um, calling him out, calling the producer out for, um, for not showing the part where I talk about how I got it on Amazon Prime. Um, right. That's the whole reason the guy called you, allegedly. Yeah. And um, so, so he, he releases another video of me talking about filmmaking tips, right? Filmmaking tips. And, you know, that, that was cool, but I, I now realize that the interviewer completely, completely misunderstood what I was talking about. I mean, not like he really cared, but um, right. so so he, he asked me for advice about filmmaking, documentary filmmaking. And I talked about how you got to just be fearless. Um, you know, all the rules, documentary filmmaking may seem, uh, filmmaking in general may seem, um, very very hard it's very gate kept uh it's a very gate kept uh industry you know you don't have a lot of capital it's very hard to to make it and um so i i, I just basically said that you gotta you gotta just do your own thing um make up your own rules about filmmaking uh, but from the from the storytelling perspective you know stuff like that right. uh but the interviewer he kind of just completely completely misunderstood that and he thought I meant um, by say he thought I meant that as in crossing ethical boundaries, right? Like making up a story. Oh, he he thought I meant like oh using using videos like whatever way you want. Um, uh, not okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's like that's obviously not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you can use what I said for right. Like the way edit wasn't a manipulation either, right? Yeah. Like you, you, can, edit you can use interview. what I say for for any, any sort, any kind of filmmaking in general, you know, obviously the ethical guidelines, you know, permissions and stuff like that. You gotta, you gotta get that taken care of. You can't even do that. Like you shouldn't be in filmmaking. Right. Yeah. That's unfortunate. See Mark jerk face, jerk face. And I, Danny, I thought you handled yourself very well when he, you, when he said, well, the guy hired the worst attorney possible, the crew, whatever the term, the adjective was, and you addressed it. He said, yes, Regarding this, I would do that. However, da 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 da, and I thought you handled yourself very well when he became accusatory. So I compliment you on that. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. And I can't wait to compliment you after I watch it after this. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello to the world. Uh, so, <laughs> so Danny, um, is there anything else you wanted to share with us? Any other stories or oh any gosh, other kind you guys of were projects? Ask, you guys were asking about following projects, and somehow yeah, absolutely turned into this. Like, what happened? Um, anyway, so for my, for my following projects, what I've been thinking of doing was, um, have one big project a year while also having smaller projects on my YouTube channel, you know, so the, the COVID type videos on YouTube, um, would be that type of video, you know, I'm working on another one of those right now, more investigative type that would be for YouTube and, uh, for, um, the mainstream, more mainstream one, I'll also produce one uh, every year, go, hoping to uh, produce one um, right now. And that would be the one that I would take to the film festivals and um, go the mainstream route. Seems like you're hitting it from both sides. It's a really good way to diversify. Yes, yes. Um, you know, because it's so unpredictable, right? Um, well, I mean, let's be honest. I, You know, we're trying to be find the truth and we're finding that certain aspects of the mainstream media have been withholding or, you know, pushing or pulling agendas, how they see fit. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only way to do, to do business anymore. Exactly. So there are workarounds. So we have to exactly. take advantage of that. Exactly. But for my, for my next project though, I would love it to, to premiere at some festivals and be competitive during the awards. Uh, because, you know, that's, one of the biggest criticism of square one, which is very valid was, um, 
was a lot of the from a lot of like the technical aspects, right? But the thing is, it's while I was doing Square One, a lot of the things I truly, truly didn't understand about filmmaking, um, because I was I had I had two roads to go down. Um, because I could either learn about filmmaking, right? Take my time, learn everything about filmmaking, then go film it. That's going to take a lot of time, you know? Right. That's or, like a long way to go or you can I, kind of learn on the way. Yeah. That's a, or, or I could just make it to how I know would fit and then start um, learning it on the way, doing it both at the same time. And I chose, I chose doing it at the same time. Yeah. It's almost like a trade when you're doing it you know, as you learn, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you can, you can prepare all you want, but there's always going to be challenges that come up. It's great to get started right away and get those, get those feet wet and start yeah. charging. I mean, yeah. And, um, you know, with a lot of, when you look at a lot of the guidelines and stuff like that, you know, it's not even recommended to start a documentary until you have like proper funding, you have a proper budget, you know, of how, how you do things. And I think there's, I just, I just had, um, I was just so clueless you know, I had, I had the audacity to be like an idiot to just go out and just film it however I want and do it all by myself. So yeah, but it seemed to work out okay. And you probably learned a crap ton of things, right? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Learned learned so much from this process and just just filmmaking in general. You know, I always loved, love, love, love movies. You know, my dad is a huge, huge cinephile. Uh, so growing up, I watched so many tons of great movies with him, you know, silent films, black and white films, um, classic Hollywood, you know, French new wave, stuff like that. And, um, so I always, um, I think that, that helped me a lot as well from a storytelling perspective. Absolutely. Cause that was a lot more into the story back then, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't have the visuals like they do now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. What are the couple topics that you're, hoping to focus on in your next couple projects um, from a YouTube YouTube one. It's a, uh, it's going to be about, uh, I don't want to give it away, but it's, it's going to be a similar, similar case to the MJ one, but um, it's, um, it's, it's not going to be someone that well known to the mainstream audience. I don't think okay. so you have, to, so have to stay tuned for that. It's a more of an investigation style. Okay. Um, and for the one that I'm taking to the festival, that's where, um, cause I've been living in China for the past half a year. Um, I've, I've shot a, I've shot a documentary, um, in China. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be government related, right? It's going to be a character study. Uh, it's gonna be a character study. And that sounds um, cool. Yeah. Because it's a lot of the times these things are so you can make a documentary about something in another country, especially like China without it being politicized, you know, right. Where you, you completely missed the point of how like day-to-day -day citizens live. Um, but so we got half of that done now. Uh, the other half is going to be shot in the U S um, but I'm going to need, I, I can't really travel to the U S right now. <laughs> so it's going to, I'm going to have to wait a little bit. So speaking of China in your, in your YouTube documentary regarding COVID or coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, when did you finally leave China? Uh, just, just, when did I leave? When my visa yeah. when my visa expired. So that's when you finally were able to leave the country. Yeah, I mean, I would have stayed longer um, to be okay. fair, um, because the situation there right now is a lot better than it is here in Vancouver. Right. Um, because. Like, let me tell you how insane it was. We had a, we like, I, I had a face, I had my face mask on outside and I, I kind of just like took it off to like kind of cough. And this guy beside me was like, did you hear what happened in this other city that was beside us? And what happened was like, someone got quarantined like that. That's oh. how insane it was. Like if you, if you had at our peak in our city, we had around 20 cases and they were acting like it was like the end of the world, man. It was insane. Wow. Like so that I, was January, February. Uh, yeah, it, January, it, February, March. Okay. Like, for example, right now, I hear that there's a case in a mall, and the mall don't even close. So it's like, it's very puzzling to me. Probably in the food court. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got, a, I got a little fever a couple of days Danny's ago. Danny's got some explaining to do. <laughs> I got a, got a little fever a couple of days ago, and I had to go do a COVID test. 
Holy mackerel. Yeah. Everything okay? Yeah, yeah. I got the results good. today. Oh, good. Another congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yay. So how is it in Canada? Turtle. What are the conditions like up there? I mean, we don't I don't know anything about the conditions up there. I know that Arizona, Florida, and Texas had huge spikes because we decided to all get together again. <laughs> but, it's a big party. Oh, uh, Canada, I think uh I, I I really don't I really don't even know. I just I see yeah. cases like I just followed the Instagram page that tells you where they have new cases. And um, it's just it's just puzzling to me that the malls would stay open when there's a case inside the mall. It does and, seem odd. Well, yeah. Arizona yesterday had negative two cases, uh, how, negative two deaths. How do you have negative two cases? I'm just it's letting almost, you know, sir. Dude, they, I'm not good at math, but they, that's a bunch of crap. I think they overcounted the day before. It's weird. We had like oh, zero, but we had so overcounted by two the day before, so they gave us negative oh, two. Okay, well, it's a well, so we're improving best greatly. Best, <laughs> best recovery in the world. We're having resurrections, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> zombies so yeah but so is it like a whole mask up thing real quick I, I i don't mind going back to like the other conversation i was just curious what it's like are they pretty strict about masks in canada not really i mean indoors yes but outdoors barely anyone's wearing them yeah that's pretty much here <laughs> but in the yeah. in the mall are all the stores open in the mall except the store that the person like got infected in which I don't know how that works. You got to leave a mall. You got to go into it, you know? Yeah. Wouldn't you follow the video camera to see every store that That's person what I was thought. in? In China, what would happen is that they would track this guy down and then they would track every guy this guy was near and then quarantine all of them right. for like 12 days. For example, they had 12 cases in Beijing or four, it was like 12 cases or something like that. And it was the internet went crazy. It was like, yeah, we are we are idiots. Like we're gonna we're we're screwing this up again. We're the embarrassment of the world. And they they quarantined over twenty four thousand people. I think over that. But Beijing has twenty million people, right? Mm -hmm. And they had twelve cases. This was like during the recovery, though. Like during the right. recovery, all of right. a sudden they had twelve, and um, and um, you know the entire the entire country man was just they were just like we're we're done. We're we're gonna be Italy. This is, this is going to be worse oh than my gosh. we're going to be worse than Wuhan. Like we're, we're screwing this up for everyone. It was just hilarious to see. It but, is, but heck, they're really efficient. It seems like yeah, because of the freaking you yeah. know when it comes to stuff like this, they they can like they can like hang their head up high. I hear you. Yeah, but it's also, crazy. Yeah, but also it's like because uh, obviously everyone has heard about the horrors of like how they have security cameras everywhere and stuff like that. They can track you. But it's like my my friend over there, he lost his dog, and they were able to like trace his dog back to him to see where he ran. So that's kind of like. But like isn't the London the same way with CCTV? I mean, isn't aren't there other countries that are just as just the same? London's really good, I heard. Yeah. So how do you? I can't, I can't see that. That's there's other countries that are democratic or whatever word you want to use that have just as many cameras as China. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I mean, or maybe I'm totally full of crap. Yeah, I I mean, there's a, I think there's a there's also like the social security score or stuff like that. But I'm I'm told by people there that it's like no one's really using it because it's just it's too many people to track, you know. So it's more of a more of a thing they say on the surface. Even oh. the censor. So even even with the censorship, what happens is like um they're like they're crazy, right? They censor everything. But what happens is um there's usually like a there's usually like a few hour few hour period where where they can't censor everything because the flood of comments just come in. Um so you would I would go to sleep at night and everyone is like criticizing them. And I would wake up in the morning, everything is gone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, so they just like bombard it all at the same time yeah. and then they start deleting them manually as they get yeah. through them. But even, so they even, go back and delete the comments, basically. The, the CCP, they um, oh, that's not the CCP. I don't, know, I don't know the acronym. Can't think of it at this moment. But um, the government the state. Just, Can we just call them the state? The state just um, they 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 censor everything that that um that talks against them. You know, they hate criticism. Even <laughs> even when I released a YouTube video, you know, I was kind of I was scared, man. Like, heard, I've heard horror stories of people. People like going missing for stuff like this, you know, posting something anti, like not exactly like saying they did a great job, you know, and um, 
I, I found out because I, I know a lot of people there in these type of things that if you do it, if you tell, if you like talk bad about them outside of China, like it's usually fine. But if you do it like in a Chinese network, like then you're toast. Yeah, I can imagine. That would almost be like treasonous, I would think. Yeah, I'm not going to get too, too, too much into this though. Because obviously- No, no, let, I'm happy to step away from that. But, yeah, I'm uh, just curious since it's uh, <laughs> I'm not fascinating. Saying it's bad, you know? I'm not saying it's No, bad. not at all. No, I'm not just curious because it's an environment that I know very little about. And I'm yeah. that's my, how my brain works, that if there's something, anything that I don't know about, I ask questions about because I like t- to know stuff about stuff that I don't know about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we- Chris and I have no other agenda other than our innate curiosity about things yeah. Absolutely. I, on this I podcast. Like we don't. Yeah. Yeah. I separate the Chinese culture from the Chinese government. Absolutely. Yeah. I love how you mentioned that on yes. that and that uh, YouTube video as yes. well. And then that's so true. It's like the people are kind, warm, gentle people. That has nothing to do with the state that's running things. I know. And people, people sometimes just, they can't, they can't seem to like find a difference, you know? It, it seems of, obvious. Kind of there's a huge difference. It's kind of sad, but um, it is guess, very sad uh, because I guess there's also like a pretty freaking big, like vocal, nationalistic, like um, Chinese um, group. But it's like, like, what do you expect them to do, man? It's literally like you can't just like be. It can't be like a license to be racist towards them, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's un it's unfortunate. I mean, but. That's the that's the thing. This divide and conquer by other like information news sources, they kind of want us going at each other so they can do their own stuff behind the scenes. Yeah. Like I live in a pretty Asian. There's a lot of Asians in Vancouver, um, but even at the mall, like when I first got out of um, self isolation, I went to the mall, and there was this, this there was this older white gentleman who was just going off at this like Asian guy, like old guy. And the old, I, I didn't know what they were saying, but the old guy was just repeating like, hey, it's 2020. Stop saying that to me. It's 2020, man. It's 2020, man. It was just heartbreaking to watch. Wow. And, um, you know, even, even a, I think a couple of weeks ago, some, I was walking, I was walking to get a popcorn. Um, and someone pushed me from behind and said, learn to walk straight. And then I'm like, like, I just said, fuck, I said, fuck out of here. <laughs> and then the guy, and the guy comes back to me all up in my face, and he's just like oh, berating me, like following, like he started, he started following me for oh like a few gosh. steps. This I, is I, in I, Vancouver. Yeah, this is in Richmond. I had it on video. It was on my Instagram story. Wow. And um, oh, I'll you know. follow you on that as well. <laughs> I, uh, it, I, social media. I'm sorry. Tangent. Tangent. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, social media i suck at Damn you guys gotta get I, into that if you i'm trying like, i'm trying my hardest it. man i'm burned out after like a month mm-hmm. and i just started so i apologize for my um novice amateurism danny my dogs will follow you on instagram right after this <laughs> thank you so much i need them need, the, need them instagram followers you know uh we will both we will do both can you tell us the instagram is it at danny woo is this Dan- D- D Y W D Y W U. That's my nickname. D Y W. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Nickname D Y W, and my actual name has less syllables. Nice. <laughs> That's ironic. Isn't that funny? So how did you get the nickname? Name? No, I'm just kidding. No, I yeah. obviously know how you get the nickname. <laughs> it's uh, Danny U Wu. That's my um. That's my phone name. Very nice. And that's your uh, inst- uh, that's your Twitter, I think, right? At Danny Danny Wu Yu. It's like Correct. yeah, yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> Nice. Excellent. All right. See, we got you. I followed you on that one. I just don't know. I don't, I, like I said, I've got a face for podcasting, so I don't (laughs) take many pictures. You're not an Instagrammer. I am not a grammar of the Instagram. Just take pictures of your food, bro. Maybe I'll do that. See, you're welcome. Thank you. Omelets and stuff. (laughs) You guys, I I, I haven't seen what you guys look like, but um, you definitely have a voice. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. That's why there's this Instagram one goes is my out dog to the only. Ladies. We tried really hard. Actually, we found, I think to your point, you were talking about sound, like quality, right? Mm-hmm. When we started this, we want this to have some kind of purpose to it. Of course. And we felt we invested a good amount of money into the studio equipment just to make the quality sound 
you know, acceptable, you know, we want it to sound good and, and professionally done. We actually care about the topics that we talk about. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think, yeah, your mic quality is just, it's, it's incredible. And, Thank uh, you, Shore SM7B. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if, did you, did you hear that? This is the microphone. This is the, the following microphone. The predecessor microphone was the one Michael Jackson used to record a thriller. Wow. Yeah. The Shore well, SM7. I did, I did think I heard it. You guys mentioned it on the last podcast. Right? I did. Yes, yeah. correct. So these are actually the 7B is the following of the SM7, which is the one Michael Jackson used to record Thriller. The wow. album, not just the song. I mean, my, my wow, I'm still I'm still like shocked about it. But, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I knew it, but it wasn't yeah. it wasn't fake. Though, I'm just trying to say. Yeah, we're just, full, <laughs> we're just full of crap over here, too. So that's cool. We're good. That's all my questions, Marcus. So is there anything else you want to share with us, Danny? You want to tell us a little bit more? Obviously, we want to make sure that you get the proper recognition for all the hard work you put into this. And and once again, to be clear, we we always want to offer someone to express themselves. We're not here to take a side or anything. We're going to release this exactly how we recorded it. So, that sounds good. you know, we just want to honor that, you know, give you that honor as well. So if there's anything else you want to share and give us all your... Uh, ways to get a hold of you so we can add to your following just uh please <laughs> please go ahead and state them now we'll we'll, we'll put them on the website as well if it's just like search danny will usually i'll come up and you can just follow me there um perfect yeah. except <laughs> instagram right. is dy woo dy woo yeah and that was instant we know we're gonna we're gonna both follow you look for uh roxy underscore and underscore anders that's is that it correct? the two dogs there's gonna be uh that's gonna be chris's two dogs Wow, I haven't yeah. haven't done a podcast in a long, long time. Well, thank you so much for your time. I mean, this was great for us because we we wanted to get to know you also. We didn't we didn't just want to make this a square one centric type thing, yeah. uh, but we wanted to hear your stories and you know get to know you. So, yeah, if fun. you're in Phoenix, let us know. We're here. We'd love to. We love maybe we can break bread sometime. Yeah, I have good good friend Edwin that lives in uh lives in Phoenix. He's also um a big big YouTuber that I met at one of the premieres excellent yeah well we could love to get in touch with him maybe we could do collaborate on something as well <laughs> yeah sounds good man danny thank you so much for uh for being with us once again this has been a knocked conscious episode christopher would thank you like you, to danny. say cello or anti -cello? Adios. thank you danny really appreciate your time thank you so thank much thank you thank you for having da me once again we were here with danny Wu, the producer and director of square one documentary danny thank you so much again we're going to be out of here please check us out knocked conscious thanks so much Thank you.